Hello, everybody. Okay. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. We want to get started. I, I, uh, when people come on time, you want to reward them for doing that, and there are others that will come a little later, and we'll welcome them when they get here. But we're not going to punish ourselves because they're not here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is John Hamry. Uh, I'm the president here at CSIS, and I'm delighted to have you here this afternoon. Very important, uh, very, very important subject. We'll explain in a minute. Um, First, I'd like to say thanks to our friends from Alcoa who have decided to make this as a series possible for us to present it to the policy community in Washington, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, it's, everyone knows what an absolutely remarkable transition has occurred over the last 30 years in China, and it's, it's been a spectacular rise. And it's been good for us. It's a very good thing for the world, and it's good for the United States. We want China to succeed. Uh, and I must say, personally, I'm impressed at the enormous pragmatism, you know, of the Chinese uh, people and the Chinese government to manage through really complicated problems. For being in a town right now that can't get anything done, you know, it's, and you see what China's doing, and we ought to be pretty humble uh, about it. So holding a conference on Chinese financial reform is not a criticism. Yeah, it is an expectation and a hope that we can help with a very important thing. It's like I say, it's important for us. It's important for the West. It's important for China. Uh, China is facing some enormous challenges, of course. This recession has not exempted them. Uh, it's, a, it's shown up in different ways. Uh, and there are other enormous challenges, a demographic challenge, a, you know, the a migration challenge, which is enormous. Uh, environmental issues, which are huge, uh, and, uh, and needing to retool the entire approach to an economy, away from an export-based economy to a consumption-based economy. So these are big, big things, and of course, for that to happen, it needs to have uh, a very, very solid foundation uh, in the finance industry. And there are some issues here, and there are some challenges here. We're going to explore that. Uh, this afternoon, and I'm grateful all of you can come. I, I'm especially grateful that my very good friend and uh, colleague, Tim Adams, is uh, going to lead this off with, uh, with, a, with a keynote speech for it. Uh, I've known Tim for five, six years. He, of course, was uh, Under Secretary for International Affairs in the Treasury Department uh, in, the, in the Bush administration and then uh, was out for a time and has now taken over as a CEO for the Institute for International Finance. And I'm glad I don't have his job. because First of all, I wouldn't be competent to handle it, but he's also uh, meant to be a leader for all of the most sophisticated finance houses in the world. And I surely would fail in that job, but he will not. He will succeed, and he's a, an enormous talent. We're delighted to have him here, and I'm delighted to say he's also decided he could still stay on as a senior advisor to us here at CSIS. So, uh, Tim, thank you, and we welcome, and why don't you get this off for real? Thank you. Please welcome Tim Adams. Thanks. Thank you, John. It's, if I could do as good a job at the IAF as you have done with CSIS, I would consider myself very fortunate, very lucky. Uh, and I also want to thank Alcoa. I worked for Paul O'Neill for a couple of years, former chairman and CEO of Alcoa. I learned a lot about uh, molten metal from John, from Paul, and we, uh, we spent a lot of time touring places, factories around the world in which he would always give it a, a judgment, uh, a numerical ranking on its uh, cleanliness and safety. Uh, I learned a lot from, from Paul, as, as we all did, uh, beyond just safety and, and metal. He was a good guy. In fact, I saw him on CNBC yesterday, and uh, he hasn't changed a bit. Uh, I also want to acknowledge our great panelists today, uh, Mark Sorello from the IMF. It's always good to have our friends from down the street here. Bob Doner, my former colleague uh, from Treasury, who kept me out of trouble as much as he could. Uh, John Deary from the Financial Service Forum, which is one of the premier uh, financial trade associations in town, and uh, CSIS's own Matt Goodman, who has the great combination of charm and intelligence, and that's hard to find sometimes in Washington. So uh, I'm sure whatever deficiencies that I exhibit today uh, or things that I leave out, these four gentlemen will do a magnificent job filling in the holes and, and taking my comments and actually giving them some life. Uh, it's uh, 
It's timely to be here and talk about this issue. I was at, uh, in Beijing about six or seven days ago. I was invited to speak at the China Development Forum. Uh, and uh, it was my first visit there. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Chinese officials bring in the 60 or 70 largest uh, multinational uh, corporation CEOs. And there's a discussion about the, the common challenges that they face, but also about begin to think about what China's development strategy looks like. And of course, this was an interesting time because it's just at the beginning of the, of, uh, the start of a new leadership. In fact, we saw uh, the premier who came and spent some time with us and laid out in, in kind of rough order his vision for the, the assembled crowd. Uh, and then the CEOs had divided themselves in four or five different working groups and offered some suggestions for Chinese officials and what they might, and it, it was all standard fair intellectual property right protection, some of the things we've all been working on for some time. But there's also this, this idea that, you know, transitioning China from you know, big growth, fast growth, uh, to smarter, more intelligent growth, and I think that's probably right. Uh, I don't want to shortchange big growth. It's been incredibly beneficial to China. If you think about the statistics that they've racked up over 30 years, John alluded to, and not only just the track record, but the macro management that they put in place. I was actually in Beijing the day uh, when uh, the former administration, the former officials announced the 4 trillion yuan uh, response to the financial crisis. I don't know how much it actually really was, but there was a headline effect that was pretty impressive. Uh, and helped, I think, begin to insulate China a little bit from the crises that gripped the U.S. and, and really and still grip our friends uh, on the continent of Europe. But, you know, it, it, it's not without some challenges. Uh, the economy has slowed over the past year more sharply and, uh, and longer lasting than many expected, certainly longer than I had expected. Uh, nominal GDP, the key determinant of corporate and government revenues, and the bank's ability to grow out of their large, uh, mostly invisible NPL problem has plummeted from 17% average in the 04 to 2011 period to something close to 9 or 10%. But I think for those who have been predicting the, the big crash uh, of China, and they're numerous, we see them all the time, we turn on CNBC once a week and there's someone who's uh, uh, prognosticating about the coming doom and gloom of China, I think, uh, I think they're proven wrong. And uh, even going back and looking at some of my uh, Treasury memos from 2004, 2005, you know, even we were at the time uh, probably exaggerating the near-term challenges or likely changes uh, in the trajectory of the economy. Uh, but 2013 will continue to remain difficult. There is some pickup in investment and property prices. I certainly heard a lot about property when I was there. Transactions have picked up a little bit. But the labor market remains soft and external demand faces extraordinary headwinds, uh, especially from Europe, which remains China's number one export market. And there are, uh, there are a lot of inventories that need to be worked off. And it, obviously there is excess capacity, which continues to be put in place. I don't know what the latest capacity utilization rate is, but I'm, I'm sure Bob's got that statistic at hand, but it's large and it continues to grow, especially in some key sectors. But beyond the cyclical factors, there are structural shifts. Wages and capital costs are rising, and the economy is shifting to a new and lower, probably more sustainable growth pattern. The challenges are large, namely uh, the threat of the middle income trap of growing old before growing rich and the numerous imbalances that I and some of my colleagues have been talking about for many of these years. Uh, to address these challenges, China must shift away from a strategy of artificially low interest rates, artificially low exchange rates, although the exchange rate has certainly become less uh, misaligned than it was uh, back when I was at Treasury. And there has been progress, and we should note that progress, and I, I want to applaud the progress. The overinvestment, especially in uh, state-owned enterprises, questionable infrastructure spending, and still a reliance on net export-led growth. And shift away from this to something much more consumption-driven, but more higher quality of investment. This is all the more urgent because investment's ability to drive growth is diminishing. The so-called marginal efficiency of capital is falling. What we're seeing is investments contribution to growth is declining despite the fact that China still invests increasing amounts. Um, and so it just tells you that the quality of that investment is declining. 
And then, as I mentioned, the top export markets remained uh, uh, in questionable condition. As uh, Zhumin, the IMF uh, Deputy Managing Director, and a good friend said recently, the key for China is not just growth, it's quality of growth and it's reform. And I'm going to talk about four or five reforms, and none of these are, are unique or controversial. In fact, I think if you were to look at the various five-year plans or white papers that have been put out or the kinds of documents that are negotiated as part of the uh, SNED, it's all fairly standard fare. And what I, the point I want to make, uh, the macro point is that these are, the, these are the elements for reform. They're doing some of these things, but they need to be accelerated. The first one is interest rate liberalization. Deposit rates are negative, which is drive, helping drive savers to the shadow banking sector in search for yield. That's not an unusual phenomenon. It's happening all over the world. Shadow banking credit expen expansion is surging. Trust products alone jumped by sevenfold in January, sevenfold in January, and the sh shadow credit expansion grew by 40% in January year over year. There's a massive explosion in uh, non-bank credit. And it, that encompasses a whole host of different kinds of products, but what worries me most is some of these trust elements, these trust products that are being sold at the retail level with not a lot of transparency. Liberalizing interest rates will help attract back some of these flows into deposit accounts and help raise household income in a more broad-based manner, which in turn can help support consumption, again, shifting from investment to more consumption-led growth. Higher lending rates can help better allocate capital, those investments with higher returns. And again, that's important because of growing excess capacity. At one of the sessions I attended at the China Development Forum, the person sitting next to me was the, is the CEO of Michelin Tire. And we, I was asking about the, the tire industry in China. He said it's, it's very crowded. There's lots of producers, a lot of uh, low cost, low quality producers. He said the problem is, is that there's massive additional expansion every single day. Every major Chinese tire producer is adding expansion, even though there's questionable demand. And the fact is there's just not the market signals. There's not the sense and, the, and the, the, the capital cost threshold that has to be overcome that would regulate or modulate that kind of expansion. And so what we'll see, not only tires, but a whole host of products, uh, uh, too much capacity. And when that happens, usually countries like to export their excess capacity. So higher lending rates will help better allocate capital, those investments with higher returns, will help shift capital from state to private companies, and potentially, ideally, to small and medium-sized enterprises. It will also move national income from the corporate sector to the household sector. Without, without the income shift, the household sector can't consume. Now, squeezing interest rate margins will impact bank earnings. I have 23 of the largest Chinese financial institutions as clients, so I'm going to be a little careful about uh, not being too critical. But it will uh, certainly squeeze bank earnings, and some of them uh, have had uh, tremendous quarterly returns. I was at the Agriculture Bank of China last week, and they're reporting all the returns late last week, so many of them were in Hong Kong. Uh, and I think uh, we the numbers are around 19, 20 percent for ABC and some of the other firms, I, I, ICBC and others had even more spectacular returns. So these banks are generating a tremendous amount of cash and returns. Uh, a lot of this is just off interest rate margins. Changing that changes the, the, the business model for many of these banks, but in many ways it forces efficiency and forces them into other revenue sources, fee-based income, which is more reflective of U.S. or Western-based institutions. The second uh, issue for reform, and I would be remiss if I didn't offer my thoughts on it, is exchange rate liberalization. So, Bob, it's probably 10 years now I've been talking about this. Uh, I'll be the, as I said earlier, I'm the first to admit that there is progress, and um, and the currency is testing new highs. I didn't see what today's rate was, but uh, looking earlier in the week, we uh, continue to to test new highs. Continued liberalization will reduce the subsidy for exporters, push investment from the tradable to the non-tradable sector and services, which will be tough. There's enormous vested interest in the export sector, but what I did hear from the premier when I saw him uh, a week or so ago. There's a lot of focus on service sector reform, broadly speaking, but also with respect to financial services. Again, I think that's quite positive. The employment growth opportunities in the service sector are enormous. And it's better jobs, more interesting jobs, and a higher value added. The third area is capital account liberalization and the interna internationalization of the RMB. We certainly see that, and we're going to see this even more so no matter where I travel around the world. My clients 
and officials continue to ask me, how quickly will the RMB internationalize? Uh, what's occurring? What infrastructure changes are occurring? It is, uh, it is an object of uh, interest from, uh, from Brussels to, uh, uh, to Brasilia. Uh, capital controls are becoming less necessary as interest rate and exchange rates liberalize and officials seek to make the RMB more actively used for international trade and investment. Uh, the quick and robust market response to this effort certainly validates the initiative. Advancing reform in this area includes enlarging the quota and broadening the scope of the Qualified Foreign Institutional Investor, the QFE uh, program, which provides a window for foreign uh, portfolio investment in China, into China, and the Qualified Domestic Institutional Investor program, which allows residents investment abroad. I think this is an incredibly important phenomenon because it allows domestic savers the capacity to diversify their risk and look for greater returns. And if I were a Chinese citizen, I would want to diversify away from uh, concrete savings, which is real estate and, uh, and a stock market, which uh, gyrates with uh, questionable uh, dynamics. And uh, again, a savings, uh, a passbook savings and deposit accounts with negative real interest rates. But to do that, they're going to have to open the capital account more. They're going to have to strengthen the banking sector to be able to withstand the capital sloshing in and out as they open up. So it means we need a more durable banking system, and that's in all of our interest. The fourth is competition from and opening up to foreign institutions. Foreign uh, financial institutions uh, can help bring in new technology, systems, human capital, business models. They're all less reliant on spreads and better risk management. We're actually... The IF is doing some training in China with Chinese institutions on private wealth management, and those practices and those uh, uh, protocols that we're using are imported from a variety of different places, including um, a number of asset management firms in Switzerland. So there is the capacity for human uh, uh, capital development, but also institutional infrastructure development where, where that foreign institutions can bring. And lastly, which is the one I want to focus on a little bit, is uh, capital market development. And I certainly heard this repeatedly when I was in Beijing. Uh, bond and stock markets will allow improving capital pricing, put competitive pressures on banks, and create alternative sources of capital funding, which will improve invaluable given uh, uh, funding sources if the banking sector becomes impaired. And that's what we're learning from Europe, because Europe is an incredibly banked economy. And when the banking system is impaired for a variety of reasons, European banks are uh, deleveraging, they've got uh, uh, regulatory regimes that are requiring uh, greater liquidity, greater, greater capital, that because of that, there are no mechanisms for credit extension in Europe, uh, and capital market development allows an alternative to that. It, 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 U.S. capital markets have been an important alternative whenever we've had banking crises in the U.S., not only the current one, but also the SNL crisis in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Capital market development will create new financial and savings instruments that allows for maturity transfer, making savings more stable, more durable, as well as more diversified. Thus, households can reduce their precautionary savings and experience greater protection from downside risks, from accidents and illness. A developed capital market is necessary for a social safety net. For example, life insurance penetration is only 1.8% of GDP in China compared with 7% in South Korea. And the Chinese people have two-thirds of their assets in bank deposits versus 23% in Hong Kong and 6% in the U.S. A more fully developed capital market allows for risk mitigation instruments and strategies to help firms hedge risks. And a more fully developed capital market can also provide long-term financing for capital projects and infrastructure. Certainly using capital market instruments to fund infrastructure makes more sense than using short-term bank lending or short-term inflows from abroad. Let me just take this one step deeper, and I want to focus just on the bond market, because here I think that what I certainly heard in my message for, for Bob and, and others at Treasury is I think, there's, I think the door is open for further bond market development. In, in fact, uh, I've heard that uh, throughout Asia, and Bob and I used to work on local bond market development in Southeast Asia. And I think there's enormous opportunity as many countries are looking to develop capital markets, but specifically bond markets. Uh, the bond market is playing an increasingly important role in, in the financial system of China. From about $825 billion in 2004 to $4 trillion, $4 trillion of dollars, uh, at the end of 2012. But still small relative to GDP. And 70% of outstanding bonds were issued in the government sector, with the corporate sector comparatively small. 
the Ministry of uh, uh, Finance, the MOF accounted for about half of the government sector, 32% of total, and the policy banks, predominantly the China Development Bank, uh, accounted for the other large share, and that's the finance infrastructure. Although they've grown rapidly during the past year, corporate bonds remain relatively small in, with respect to market share, and they have grown uh, extraordinarily over the past year, growing by, in dollar terms, by 60%, that's 60%, but still relatively small market share, about 25% of overall market share. And corporate bond issuance is dominated by state-owned enterprises. The Ministry of Railways is the single largest corporate bond issuer. Most of the issuance of short and medium term is partly due, uh, rather than long term, is partly due to the onerous approval process for longer term issuance. So you have uh, the corporate, uh, a lot of uh, commercial paper, but very short term corporate debt and official debt. Uh, and you, so you end up with a maturity mismatch uh, that is what makes the banks uh, somewhat vulnerable. Uh, bond issuance has become an increasingly popular tool, but not yet emerged as an official channel for the rapidly growing private sector, and hopefully this will change uh, over the coming years. Commercial banks are the dominant investor in the bond market generally, holding about two-thirds of outstanding debt at the end of 2012, and uh, state-owned enterprises are the largest investor in corporate debt. So the direct, the direct participation of foreigners is fairly small and limited. To advance financial sector reform and improve the functioning of the domestic bond market, the government has launched over the last year several interesting uh, efforts. The emergence of a high yield bond market, I think, is, uh, is intriguing. And then a pilot municipal bond market, which can allow municipalities to move away from uh, bank borrowing or uh, getting in the uh, development, uh, land development business, which obviously is fraught with lots of challenges. I certainly applaud these efforts. I assume that official Washington does as well. Uh, the rapid expansion of the bond market during the past few years demonstrate the great potential for financing in both official and private sectors. Bonds offer a viable alternative to the, com the economy's traditional reliance on bank loans and could also boost the finances of local governments. Moreover, developing a large source of long-term funding will be crucial for carrying out the country's urbanization drive underpinning the next phase of development, as well as I said, developing a social safety net. Certainly the issue of urbanization as a driver of growth was repeated frequently, noting that uh, the level of uh, urbanization in China is somewhere around 50%. The idea is you'll get to 70, 75%, which is uh, fairly standard for the surrounding region. That's between 200 and 250 million people that will move from rural to urban areas. And that can be a big driver of growth. It also means a lot more traffic in cities. And having said, and Beijing traffic last week, I'm not sure that's a positive thing, but it is a driver of growth. But to do uh, capital market development and bond market development, uh, I didn't talk much about the equity side. You also need the institutional, uh, the framework, the, the infrastructure that allows institutional and retail investors to, uh, to judge and to uh, a rate uh, that credit. You need accounting, accounting standards and uh, auditing firms. You need appropriate disclosure uh, and you need regulation and better corporate governance. You know, the way to do it and, and, and my comments at the CSRC and the CBRC is uh, regulation is important. Supervision is important. You shouldn't, you, no one should, uh, t should take away from U.S. or Western views that they should expand the capital markets rapidly no one should equate with the view they should do it uh, without an appropriate regulatory framework. They should. But also a better corporate governance framework. And of course, you need rating agencies. You need the infrastructure. So these things have to develop uh, in parallel to the markets themselves. Uh, to conclude, let me just say, the last generation of leaders started the process of reform. The new generation, just now taking over, will hopefully advance that effort. It certainly won't be easy. Entrenched interest and inertia are powerful inhibitors of change. It's not unique to Washington or to China. We have it in Washington and a whole host of other places. But those vested interests will uh, prove a challenging ob obstacle. External pressures and focus can help, and it's here where I think the SNED, which I guess is slated for June or July, uh, can apply pressure. And it's not only U.S. but pressure from other places. And I do think pressure and influence and, uh, and prioritization of capital market development in the bond market specifically uh, can make a big difference. Uh, 
why don't I stop there and, and thank again my host and see if we have some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tim. Really appreciate it. I'm Matthew Goodman, the Simon Chair here at uh, CSIS, and delighted to have all of you and join uh, John Hamry in welcoming you. And uh, thank you, Tim. You really validated our decision to invite you to start this off because I think you've really uh, laid down uh, the, all the kind of key elements of reform, which is a in, in this important sector, which is uh, a very uh, uh, complex uh, set of issues, and you've really boiled them down to some of the qu core elements. I really appreciate that. Um, let me uh, invite questions, uh, but let me ask, take advantage of having jumped up here and grabbed the microphone, to ask a question. In hindsight, um, when you were um, undersecretary, things were still going swimmingly here. It was before the, uh, before the, the financial um, crisis, and we were, you know, urging China to do some of these things then. I mean, in hindsight, what do you think we, uh, we could have said that was different or, or uh, more than what we said before, less than what we said before, different from what we said before that could have helped uh, encourage, you know, positive reform or, you know, are we not that important in this process? Yeah, uh, th that, that's a great question. I remember sitting at a dinner with Alan Greenspan and Jiranji, and Chairman Greenspan went on for an hour about the importance of markets pricing risk and how we price risk appropriately and we had to, and through structured finance and securitization we had spread risk around the world and therefore there's less risk and we were wrong you know uh, uh, and I, my concern is that because of the crisis maybe Chinese authorities took away some of the wrong lessons which is uh, well let's slow everything down and let's be very careful about reliance on markets I think markets are still important to send signals and allocate capital more efficiently but I think the lesson is you need to ensure you have the appropriate regulatory regime in place, a supervisory regime, and the right set of incentives in place. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think there are lessons to be learned. I, I think you can't dismiss our advice or our proposal simply because of the crisis we had. I, I think it's a combination of listening to what we had to offer, but also learning from our experiences, too. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. If you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. There is a microphone or a couple of microphones, and uh, please um, identify yourself and uh, ask a question. Anybody Anybody? bold enough? There we go. Uh, gentleman back there. Thanks. Um, Don Clark from George Washington University Law School. Uh, so you began your talk by, I guess, throwing a little bit of cold water, it seemed, on the, on the China bears, um, because they haven't been proved right yet. But you know, if I were a China bear, I have to say I wouldn't have, having now listened to your whole talk, I didn't hear a lot of grounds for changing the view of, of the China bears. In other words, um, I, I didn't hear you identify any kind of major financial system reforms that would suggest that things are different from in the past. For example, you know, interest rates remain uh, repressed. Uh, you mentioned the bond market, but if your description of it is accurate, it seems to me pretty much a closed system. You know, the uh, banks buy uh, government bonds and uh, SOEs buy SOE bonds. So. It doesn't look like much has happened there. So, I mean, can you identify some, uh, you know, major uh, changes in the financial system that would suggest, you know, the things are going to be different going forward from how they've been in the past? All those areas I mentioned, there's a continuum of progress that's occurring. So it's not as if there's a steady state there that interest rates, there are no, uh, there is no interest rate liberalization. In fact, there are some movements. And I think with the rise in the shadow banking, the non-bank uh, credit lending, which is exploding, it's going to create pressure uh, by the banks. Now, some of the lending and trust is, uh, products are being done off balance sheet. Some of the banks have reputational risk because of that. Uh, some of them are real, some of it's questionable, but it does put pressure by the banks to free them up to be able to, to attract back some of those deposits. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm neither a bear or a bull per se. I, 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 I guess, you know, I was on a, a panel with uh, Marty Feldstein, and Marty has been, you know, talking about China collapsing, as have others for 10 years. You know, someday they may be right, but uh, there's been a tremendous amount of money that's been made, and deals done, and growth occurred, and jobs created, and uh, in the meantime, and I think we can spend a lot of time calling for the collapse of, of a whole host of different systems, uh, the euro crisis being also a, a, a popular uh, pundit's uh, uh, attack line, without missing that there are some fundamental structural drivers, and I mentioned urbanization being one. 
But to truly achieve, I think, you know, the next two decades of growth, I do believe that better allocation of capital and more efficient allocation and a financial system that provides diversified uh, risk and gives households the capacity to have more reliance and more diversification would indeed support growth. But that doesn't mean they're going to collapse without it. They certainly have proven the bears wrong for a long time. Okay. All right. We're, if we're allowed to let panelists ask questions, I guess that's fair enough. That right? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Timmy did a great. Uh, is, 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 I think it's on. Uh, Timmy did a great job in terms of um, uh, laying out. Um, uh, John Deary, the financial services forum. Um, you did a great job in in in, in laying out um, the full range of challenges, particularly in the uh, financial space. Um, uh, these the shift, of course, that China is trying to pull off from a manufacturing for export and fixed investment model to a consumption based model. Uh, 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 this is something that they've, they've highlighted in at least the last two five-year plans. They seem you know, deeply committed to it. Certainly after the um, World Bank 2030 report came out last year, that there was a perceptible increase in the rhetoric from uh, not only the regulators, but also from the political leadership in terms of their commitment to financial reform. But it's hard. It, it's, it's a very, very hard thing to do. It, it's in a certain sense, it's analogous to the challenge that we have in terms of getting our fiscal house in order. Everybody sort of agrees, but it's, it's really hard. Um, there's been a change in leadership, of course. Um, and I'm just curious as to your perceptions and what you've been hearing in China, uh, in terms of the people you, you, you've talked with and met with in China, what their perceptions are as to the new leadership's uh, commitment to financial reform. A great question. You mentioned the, the, the uh, World Bank 2030 report. Uh, that was handed out to everyone at the China Development Forum, but I'm also told it's just now been released in China in Mandarin. So, you know, I agree with you that you could fill this room with the number of studies, white papers, reports that say that the things I talked about should be done. So we're we're in heated agreement. The question is always about implementation, the pace of implementation, and there are always political obstacles. And as I said there's vested interest associated with the export uh, industry with with state-owned enterprises, all those entities that don't want to give up whatever monopolistic rents or rents that they're that, that are accruing to them, I, I you know I think everyone's hopeful that you have a new team in place. The premier said all the right things. Uh, the question is, can you actually implement? Can you implement from central authorities at the local and provincial level? It's always the biggest challenge, and it's creating the right incentives. And I think they try to create the right incentives. But it's a, it's a big place with lots of people and lots of different levels of power and lots of different power centers. So whatever change happens is probably an incremental change. The idea of a big bang I think is unlikely. But I think we should be satisfied with the best case scenario, which is slow increment changes. And if some of the things I described, developing the bond market, allowing more outside investment, investment to flow out, I, I think it would be the best we can hope for and we should be satisfied with it. We should ask for more but we should manage our expectations. Okay, I saw Hank, do you still want to ask your, your same question? Okay, sir, right there. I'll go to the wings next. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for your comments. I'm John Fay with the Rand Corporation, and I had a more kind of technical question, uh, perhaps. Um, China just recently had a trade deficit, um, not relative to the U.S., but relative to the world. And I was wondering if you could comment on that and the nominal versus the real exchange rate, that there's a lot of politics uh, around perceptions of you know, the nominal exchange rate being uh, either undervalued or overvalued. Um, if there's inflation going on in China, then um, what is the, what's the perception of the real exchange rate? Is it actually stronger than we think it is or, or weaker? was well represented at the uh, China Development Forum. Uh, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to defer to uh, my good friend, uh, Bob Donner, who's done more work on nominal and real exchange rates than, uh, than I ever will do. So I'm going to leave it for Bob. I don't know what the public perception is. I don't know if investors or households or the corporate sector are affected more by uh, nominal or real. I'm, I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of academic research that shows one or the other. I don't know. And I'm happy to take questions on anything other than anywhere as well, on Cyprus. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, other parts My of the world. My dear friend in the back. Um, go ahead, that gentleman. 
Hi, Tim. Uh, Jahangir Aziz, uh, JP Morgan. Um, you know, we've been talking about this, you know, excessive investment growth in China for the longest period of time. Um, but if you compare, you know, per capita investment or per capita capital stock. It's true. Uh, you know, you, let's take U.S. versus China. It's just a fraction of it. And if you look at the kind of urbanization, et cetera, that China needs, you talked about the traffic jams, et cetera. So is it the case that China probably needs as much investment, but a different kind of investment? Not anymore the kind of, you know, just adding capacity to tire factories, but hospitals, schools, uh, in, you know, urban infrastructure, et cetera. A great question, and that statistic about uh, capital stock per capita is often cited relative to other uh, neighboring countries as being low. And and if you if you are a if you're a China bull and you go to the urbanization store, you think, well, they've got a long way to go before they reach equivalents of of the neighborhood. But I think you hit the point, which is it's the mix, and we need fewer uh, aluminum smelters and steel mills and entire uh, production factories. Uh, and we need more, uh, as you said, hospitals or capital stock that's associated with infrastructure. So I, I think it's a mix, not about the total amount, but we do see, we do see investments, uh, uh, force, driving force and growth is diminishing and, and dropping pretty rapidly. So it tells you something about the quality of investment. Thank you. Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Thank you, Tim. We often heard your uh, statement on Chinese currency issue when you were under Secretary of Bush administration. Comparing with Obama's administration's approach to this issue, uh, what do you think the uh, appreciation of the B has reached a turning point that could also be uh, depreciating. And how should Obama's second term handle the currency issue with China? Thank you. Thanks. Well, uh, Secretary Liu was just out there. He was out there a few days ahead of me. And I assume, and, and if I wasn't mistaken, it was on his talking uh, list of talking points. And I suspect it will be for the foreseeable future. I think what's shifted is that we have seen uh, real adjustments we have seen uh, uh, any reasonable estimation of misalignment uh, has also shows that there's uh, progress been made. And uh, we see that uh, reserve accumulation is certainly adjusted and the external accounts have adjusted. So there's less of the analytical case that one made and we did make in 2006 and 2007. The dynamics look very different, but the politics the politics aren't as acute as they were then either, which is kind of remarkable. I would have said, uh, tell me what the U.S. unemployment rate is, and I'll tell you the, the, the noise factor that one would uh, be hearing from Capitol Hill. And in fact, uh, it's diminished over time. And I think there's a whole host of reasons for that. Certainly, we heard a little bit about it during the presidential election. Uh, uh, the Republican nominee, Mitt Romney, said on day one he would cite them as a currency ma manipulator. That was certainly a play to, for Ohio. But if you spend time on the Hill now, there's just not much uh, the kind of hearing the kind of pressure and rhetoric that you heard four or five years ago. I, I, when was the last time Chuck Schumer mentioned it? You probably hear it, but I don't see it. It doesn't have the resonance it did uh, in 2007, 2008. And there was a gentleman over there. Thank you. Um, I'm Matthew Robertson. I write for the Epic Times. Um, my question is sort of about um, whether there's a kind of a tension between, um, I mean, I was just reading um, Walter and Howie's Red Capitalism, and they, they say that basically um, there are interests in the Communist Party that don't benefit from financial reform. So is there ever a, a sort of a tension where the reforms that um, you advocate would be good for China, but perhaps not good for certain interests in the party or for the party itself? And so how do you sort of manage that tension? Well, there's always winners and losers, and that tension exists everywhere. So the question is, uh, can you make the case, uh, the general case that, uh, and, the, and the losers uh, tend to be fairly uh, defined and, uh, and tend to congregate and tend to be more politically vocal, whereas 
the benefits tend to be much more dispersed and diffuse. And so that's, that's not China, that's every political uh, system. Uh, and so it's, it just requires you know, leadership and finding the right coalition and the right timing to pursue the general over the, the political power of the specific. And it's, it's true with all of our trade deals. You, know, you look at uh, US-Korea uh, free trade agreement and the auto industry uh, pushing back uh, the, uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Matt Goodman's an expert on, the Japanese have now decided that they're going to participate, or certainly in the negotiations. The question is, what does it mean for agricultural production in Japan? And what does it mean for, for rice producers, where the subsidy is enormous? Uh, there will obviously be losers in those negotiations, but the question is, do you have the political leadership and you can you create the right political dynamic that you can push the generalized benefits over the uh, the opposition of the fairly defined losers in any of those negotiations. So the reform is still good for the regime as a whole. It's not a threat. Financial reform is not a threat to the basis of the regime. The, I, I, you know, I'm not in a position to make the, that decision. I think that's a decision that would be made domestically. But again, it's about it's about winners and losers and what's the net effect. And if you make the case that the country is generally better off that they are uh, raising uh, uh, incomes and, and you're making the transition to a more sustainable growth trajectory, then I would argue that, and the Communist Party is able to pull this off, I don't know why it wouldn't strengthen their position, right? Because their legitimacy is really based on their capacity to do economic management. And if they can put in place things that actually allow them to better manage and can produce the kind of prosperity that they've promised and they need given all the challenges, it seems to me, despite potential losing sectors, that it strengthens their that it strengthens their uh, their capacity to govern. Okay, I'll take uh, another question right there, and then the gentleman a few rows behind. Yes, hello, uh, Roberto Peña. I'm with the European Union delegation. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate on the uh, level of non-performing loans in China and how. These are impacting uh, bank balance sheets, and if you've been noticing uh, the, that they've been uh, manifested on the ground with uh, higher rates of foreclosure or vacant uh, commercial real estate. Yeah, you know, the fact is we don't know. Uh, I was at a couple of institutions last week, banks, uh, big banks, they were telling me that uh, as a ratio and in, in total nominal terms, and NPLs are dropping and dropping quickly. I, you know, it, it remains to be seen. That there's definitional issues. There, how do you categorize it? Uh, and if you're just rolling a particular loan over year after year after year, it's not really non-performing. You just continue rolling it. So I think there's a categorization definition problem. It's obviously larger than anyone wants to talk about. But, and, and some of this is a result of the, the crisis response and, you know, using the banking system to fund infrastructure. And as someone said to me a couple of years ago, even if, even if the losses are 10% of GDP, it's worth it. And given the pace of growth, we'll grow out of it. And after 10 years, you know, it, it's just a blip. So I think it's large, but I, it, that's why I mentioned the nominal GDP, which is more important. Uh, but if they can sustain growth over a period of time and, and they don't continue repeating questionable lending, then, uh, then it's more manageable. I, but the question is, no one knows. And, I, you know, look, there's a lot of empty buildings, but uh, each one of those has a story behind it. I don't know. And that's when the, the, the China uh, bears are always saying you've got, you know, this massive real estate overhang and lots of empty buildings. Yes, but when you've got urbanization of between 200 and 250 million people moving to cities, the housing stock that has to be built alongside that, the infrastructure, uh, you know, there's still an enormous demand. So it's, it's hard to know. The statistics on real estate as you know, is questionable non-existent. Yeah. Okay. Take that question there. Maybe one more. Sure. Hi, I'm Charlie. I'm from George Washington University, the Alia School. Uh, so I have a question. As you mentioned, that urbanization is going to be a really important mechanism for China economic growth. And I was at the uh, Posen's forum, at, which at our school, two days ago, and he also mentioned that the the main uh, character that's going to force like China's economic growth is urbanization. So my question is: So how can the ref if so, like how can the re like financial reform help the urbanization process in China? Well, one way is the way it's funded. If you can use the bond market and longer dated uh, debt 
that's more, uh, that has a maturity that's more consistent with the asset that you're funding, then it's more efficient than trying to fund long-term projects with short-term bank debt. So there is a way, you know, for example, highways built in the United States are usually built by, uh, uh, by issuing bonds. And what you need is this, this maturity match, which just doesn't occur. So uh, Ed, you said it was at the Paulson Forum. I learned a long time ago, never disagree with Hank Paulson. So if he says it's true, it has to be true. Okay. Maybe one, two more, and then we'll let Tim sit down. Leah Liu from Voice from Voice of America. Um, there have been some talks about currency wars. Um, the Peterson Institute recently had a conference on this subject. Uh, I'm curious to know uh, your view on this. Um, I'm also wondering, when you were talking with the Chinese leaders in Beijing recently, uh, have they raised this issue of these major global currencies uh, depreciating? Well, everyone has raised the issue. I was in Santiago, Chile a few weeks ago, and I heard from Chilean authorities concern about quantitative easing in the U.S. Uh, Chinese authorities uh, raised questions about the Bank of Japan, the new central bank head, uh, Mr. Kuroda. In fact, they just met today. And as some had expected, the Bank of Japan is going to be much more aggressive in, uh, in uh, uh, their open market operations. Uh, which will have an effect in weakening the yen, much of the when yen weakness has occurred in anticipation. So all those countries that are pursuing uh, non-traditional or extraordinary uh, monetary policy uh, is seen as engaging in policies that, uh, that are harming other places uh, and uh, are of questionable value. You know, what I heard from the Chileans is that uh, the marginal or the, the 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 marginal benefit of additional quantitative easing in the U.S. is is fairly low? They would argue it's negative, but it has implications for their exports. And so, I, I, you know, it was it was uh, Montega from Brazil who first coined the phrase uh, "currency wars." I don't think there's a currency war. I think you have central banks taking extraordinary measures in extraordinary times. There are obvious spillover effects. And those who are subject to those spillover effects are just voicing their, their unhappiness. And we're going to see more, certainly, out of Japan. I'm not going to ask doi -san to explain the Bank of Japan's uh, recent uh, moves, but uh, yes, sir. And then this will be the last one on, on China, but I wanted to ask one about Cyprus. Thanks. I'm <laughs> Nick Constantine from Eurasia Group. I actually had a follow-on question to that, and I was, I was going to ask about the BOJ, but Specifically, what, what advice would you give to the Chinese government? I mean, when they look at the global liquidity environment, it's clearly changing in a way that actually makes things like capital account reforms, currency liberalization more difficult to navigate, right? So that's, that's what I'd like to hear is the connection specific to the China story. I mean, how do they address this in a context of trying to pursue these reforms over the next couple of years? I think you do it slowly. I think you do it in a choreographed fashion. I think you have to ensure that as you liberalize the capital account that you've got a durable banking system that can withstand capital flows in and out. Uh, and I think you have to have, in having a durable banking system means that you've got to have transparency about uh, NPLs and other activities and you've got to have a, a very robust regulatory and supervisory regime. So it's all these things have to occur together. And my advice is, you know, to do it in a measured fashion. Uh, uh, and, and, and do it slowly and ensure that all the pieces are there rather than just rushing open. But that's exactly what they're doing. You know, we can argue should they accelerate 20% or decelerate. The direction is correct. Uh, we would like to see it maybe occur more quickly, but the key is to ensure that you've got all the pieces together. You had a question about the BOJ? Oh, oh. All right, um, uh, that is it, but since you whispered to me, you'd be willing to take questions on, on Cyprus. Let me ask one. How worried are your members about the Cyprus situation? How worried should the rest of us be about it? Is it getting better, well, under control? It's, it's, you know, Cyprus is, a, is uh, despite its diminutive size, I think the decisions that were made are precedent setting, the way in which depositors uh, were treated. Non-insured uh, non depositors are certainly taking a massive haircut. But the initial response, and that was the, the Cypriots themselves, uh, went after insured deposits. And 
if, if you look at the fragility of the banking system and the economy in the euro area was seven out of 17 countries in recession uh, and continue to face recessionary pressures, it sent the wrong signal because what it says to depositors in, in Spain and Italy and other vulnerable places is that this explicit guarantee of, of protecting your deposits may not be worth much, and it's only worth as much as your own country's balance sheet. And if your own country's balance sheet is of questionable uh, nature, then uh, if I were in one of those countries, I would put my deposit somewhere else. Uh, and doing so, you create bank runs, and then you uh, have a fulfilling uh, uh, situation where banks begin to fail. So I worry about the precedent setting. It's not the size of Cyprus. It's quite tiny, actually. But it's, it's the signal that it sends to other peripheral countries that are facing uh, enormous challenges. And we've seen that from, from European officials who've come out since then, uh, the Germans and others saying, this is a one-off affair, this is unique, we're not gonna replicate that. But uh, if I were still a small saver in Barcelona, and I would have to think hard about how long I'm keeping my savings in the local bank. Okay. But I, I think what it says is that Europeans need to accelerate banking reform, they need to, uh, euro-wide deposit insurance, at least reinsurance that backs up the sovereign balance sheet, uh, and they need a resolution mechanism. They need to continue the project they've started, and I think they will, but I think this particular crisis, and who knows what the next one, whether it's Slovenia or, or you know, the, the Italians still don't have a government, but it just tells me that, again, directionally correct, but they need to accelerate banking union as quickly as possible. Okay, thanks, Tim. Uh, you know that may sound like an ir uh, not a related topic, but but uh, the global financial system is is uh, so integrated that that this is actually very relevant. And uh, frankly, the other way around, China's financial reform is relevant to the to, to what happens in Europe. So uh, I appreciate your taking that question. Uh, if you could join me in thanking Tim for an excellent presentation, and uh, thank you. I really appreciate that. And you're welcome to stay. All right, you're welcome to stay. And um, uh, if I can invite the panelists to come up, we'll, uh, we'll move right on. I think we, uh, you know, we, we're being efficient, so we may even let you get out of here early, but uh, we want to make sure we, we cover all the ground. going to go straight on. Okay. All right. Well, um, as I say, feel free to get drinks, but we're going we're gonna to carry on. Um, so uh, again, thank you all for coming, and, uh, and uh, we're now moving on to the panel uh, discussion, and uh, again, want this to be participatory, so look forward to your uh, thoughts and questions uh, after our, our panel. But we really have a uh, a superstar panel that, that uh, I think will give a, a really useful um, complementary set of presentations to Tim's uh, because uh, they, they each bring, each of our panelists bring something very important to this story. Um, so first, uh, next to me, closest to me, Marcus Rodlauer from the uh, IMF. He's the Deputy Director of the Asian Pacific Department and has particular responsibility for China and has been very focused on their uh, financial sector. Um, I'm not going to go into the full bios because you have uh, packets which have, have more detail. Uh, Marcus will go first, but next to him uh, is Bob Doner, my former colleague at Treasury, uh, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Asia at the Treasury Department and has been in that position for, uh, for some time now, and he oversees uh, all of Asia, including, uh, including China. Uh, so he'll be able, I think, to talk to us about the U.S. government's uh, views of these issues and, and its uh, policies uh, towards, uh, towards China on these issues. Uh, and then finally, John Deary uh, from the Financial S uh, Services Forum. He's Executive Vice President for Policy there, um, and he is also um, part of a, an effort called Engage China, uh, the Engage China Coalition, which brings together about a dozen uh, trade associations um, and uh, to focus particularly specifically on this issue of Chinese financial reform. And I'm sure he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, that effort and their positions. Uh, so I'm not going to say anything of substance at this point, but I may ask a few questions uh, when we get to that stage. I'll let uh, Marcus start, and you're welcome to stay there or come up here, whichever is more comfortable. Well, maybe because our colleagues over there are a little bit blocked, I, I speak from here okay. if that's okay. Thanks a lot for um, uh, for uh, for the opportunity to be part of this uh, roundtable. 
uh, compliments to Tim, who has uh, kind of already laid out the broad parameters and has said a lot of things that I will maybe partly repeat, although from a slightly more narrow angle, I speak about the financial sector. So I will not go in detail into exchange rate liberalization and, and, and the capital account liberalization load. We can, we can maybe talk about this later on. So uh, two broad uh, points that I'm covering, the rationale for financial sector reform, for continuing this, uh, building on the steps that have already been taken, and second, the priorities that we at the fund, together with our colleagues from the bank, of course, uh, are advocating in this, in this area. A bit of context first uh, as a background to the rationale. The stock of credit in China is close to 175% of GDP. It is among the highest, if not the highest, in the world of a normal economy. That's not a f financial center like Hong Kong, who of course has claims which are much higher. Uh, and, it, and it's not just high, but it's also growing rapidly. Banks still dominate the system, and their on-balance sheet operations are still guided largely by administered interest rates and by quantitative controls, or maybe not legally controls, but guidance or indications or allocation of, of credit. In the meantime, lending outside the traditional bank lending channel to state-owned enterprises, um, both by banks, but also by non-banks, such as trusts and insurance firms, those non-bank uh, credit um, flows have expanded at a very fast pace, as Tim has, has mentioned in recent years, although from a very low base. And um, just last year, flows through these non typical credit channels have been uh, on the order of 40% of total financial intermediation. So it's not trivial anymore. It's a significant part of the flows, uh, and uh, it's growing further. The first quarter probably will be even, even higher. Um, so these developments, of course, are in part supportive of the very strong growth performance that we have seen in recent years, and that have not only helped China, but has also helped uh, globally to mitigate uh, the, the global recession. Uh, in, in that sense, has been uh, very positive. But it's, very, uh, it, it, it's, it's clearly that this rapidly changing environment is raising some very important concerns. For one, since the 2008 to 2010 stimulus program, the reliance on credit to support high growth has become ever more important. Associated with this, investment, as Tim also has mentioned, has risen now to close to half of GDP from around 40% a decade ago. And in the meantime, average GDP growth has actually fallen from around 10 to 11 to 7 to 8 by several percentage points. So this combination of more credit, higher investment, and slower growth really suggests that this current model is already facing diminishing returns, and that the continued reliance on this credit-fueled, investment-led growth poses risks to the financial system. So it has run its course as an engine of growth, but it also increasingly poses risks in, this, in the system. What are those risks? Well, uh, clearly credit quality is the first thing that comes to mind. This surge of bank lending activity in the last five years raises the risks of a deterioration of, of credit quality. The expansion in bank balance sheets has been quite remarkable. Um, stripping out interbank loans, so just really looking at the net credit outside of the banking system, this growth in, in lending is equivalent to about 60% of the entire stock of US domestically chartered banks. Now we know, of course, the US banking system is relatively mm -hmm. small compared to other markets, but to think of that almost that 60% of the US domestic banks, that's the credit flows of the last four years in China. Uh, it's not trivial. Um, credit expansion of this kind is almost, is almost always associated with si significant mispricing of risk and often, of course, do not end well. So our assessment of that quality risk is that if the financial system continues on this path, it will be hard to escape an eventually very costly cleanup. There is still time. NPLs are still low particularly, of course, in the, in the numbers, but perhaps even in reality, they are still in a manageable level. Growth is still high, and the fiscal space to absorb these losses is ample. But the longer the current trends continue, the higher the risk and costs of a eventually much sharper correction. So another new category of risks has emerged with the rapid growth in non-traditional savings and investment vehicles that I have just mentioned before. As is well known, the banks are facing increased competition for funds with this rapid growth of non-bank intermediaries who offer much more attractive yields than the banks themselves. 
so in response to this increased competition, the, bank, the banks themselves now have taken increasingly to raising funds through the issuance of these wealth management products. Now, this is, in a way, a very positive development because the authorities themselves and the government sees this as part of sort of an interest liberalization on the ground in line with the sort of very often followed two-track reform progress where they keep a control system and open up the system. There is a lot of liberalization and market activity going on there, but the concern, of course, also is well known. These products are issued at short maturities, as Tim has mentioned, and the underlying uh, f the funds are invested in longer term, uh, longer duration projects, and not just the maturity m mismatch, but often invested in very opaque asset classes. Now, some 30% of these products, wealth management products, are carrying a principal guarantee. And for those with principal guarantee, it's quite well regulated. They are deposit type system, so they have to have capital charges, they have to have provisioning, so this is not what is concerned. But even for the remaining 70%, which do not have a formal guarantee, there is a perception in the system that, in fact, the banks will eventually make sure that investors will get their money back. So there is this widespread perception of implicit government guarantees around, which to our mind and to my mind is perhaps one of the most nefarious aspects of the risks that's there. We have seen this in many other tradition, uh, transition economies where you start giving increased latitude in reforming the systems and opening up while at the same time maintaining these implicit guarantees. And the combination of both are really a recipe where you could, 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 could produce uh, very uh, difficult situations going forward. So this combination of liquidity risk, the perception of implicit widespread guarantees in the system, rapid growth of new instruments, poses really quite formidable challenges for the regulation, for the supervision, uh, as we have seen in, in many other countries before. So what's our assessment of this risk at this point? The scale of the world wealth management products, around 7% of the deposit base, is still relatively manageable. It's not yet a systemic risk, but um, if uh, this activity continues to grow rapidly, the potential risk for broader financial stress clearly will increase. And uh, the third concern, and I, this is sort of the end of my, of my, my rationale for reforms, is, is broader and is systemic, so to speak. As we have said, there has been significant reform and a lot of innovation. Many aspects of the financial sector are still characterized by this inefficient credit allocation and mispricing of credit. And thereby, it does extend and support and foster even the continuation of an ultimately unsustainable credit-fueled investment-based growth model. And uh, our assessment here, of course, is that this, this current system tends to prolong the use of this manufacturing-oriented growth model, and, and, and the limits of that is, are already becoming uh, apparent. And as longer, the longer you continue with that, uh, the, 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 the more you will raise the eventual costs of adjusting to a more sustainable uh, growth model. So the rationale for reforms are clear. The risk of a more difficult correction will only grow along the current path. And the longer additional reform is deferred, the costlier it will be uh, to adjust to a more sustainable model. So let me now turn quickly to reform priorities. The goal is clear, to foster a more robust, inclusive economic growth model, to facilitate internal rebalancing, as Tim has said, from export investment-led growth to more consumption-led growth and to also, importantly, uh, move to a more market-based monetary policy framework, which currently still relies a lot on quantitative controls to a more uh, traditional central bank uh, policy framework. Now, because this transformation will take time and often involves a lot of learning by doing, a, renew a new renewed focus on early start and an early reinvigoration is critical to make sure, in our view, that this reform uh, keeps pace with the very rapidly changing uh, financial landscape. And we see the need, therefore, for accelerated reforms now in the financial sector on along four macro dimensions, so to speak. Uh, interested liberalization, as Tim has mentioned, supervision and regulation, institutional setting, and revamping the monetary framework. I'll get to these uh, in a bit more detail down. Um, in addition, and one should never forget that, there is the very arduous, maybe boring, but equally and perhaps even more critical micro task of continuing to reform the institutions on the ground, so to speak, especially the four large state banks. When you s sort of speak with a, a 
the most senior Chinese officials and you talk to them about interest liberalization, I don't think they see it in the same way as ours. They, they question what does interest rate liberalization mean for an institution that has 350,000 bureaucrats on the ground and doing banking as they are used to doing it. So uh, reforming the individual institutions in, ed in order to be able to implement this liberalized and reformed framework, I think, is equally critical uh, for success. So on interest li liberalization, as we all know, progress has already been m made quite significantly, more than traditionally be uh, appreciated. Uh, lending rates, there is no more constraint. There is the upward margin, as you know, all know, of, 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 there is the downward flexibility from the benchmark rate of 30%. There is no upper limit. The key issue is the deposit rate, which has a 10% margin currently over the benchmark. So um, as a next step, we do see room to raise the maximum deposit rate from the benchmark plus 10% to a higher, uh, a higher, higher flexibility margin, which will uh, hopefully reduce this tremendous regulatory arbitrage that's currently going on by moving funds from the control system into the wealth management products. And um, we'll also, by contributing to generally higher interest rate in the system to reduce this bias for investing in, in real assets, particularly into housing and other investment. Um, liberal, complete liberalization of deposit and lending rates can then be completed gradually over time, pari passu with experience in actually making sure that the institutions on the ground can implement it well, the credit officers and so forth. Second, supervision and regulation. The priority is to further strengthen the regulation and supervision of non-bank and off-balance sheet intermediation. The authorities are already very focused on that. You may have seen the recent announcement. They have taken a number of steps. Um, recently, the point is now to ensure that these risks really are properly disclosed, that there is transparency, that the institutions hold adequate buffers, particularly when they give implicit or clear or principal guarantees, um, that the markets operate transparently and that the pace of growth also does not result in, in systemic risks. Very often when I hear, you know, Jahangir mentioned, of course, the, credit st the capital stock is still 9% only what it is at the US, it's true. No matter where it is, uh, the speed of convergence also is, is a critical factor in how well countries can absorb uh, the credit flows and manage them. And we have seen thousands of, uh, many hundreds of cases where uh, a convergence to an appropriate level, maybe over time, evolved at a speed that just created a lot of accidents along the way. Um, so third, reforms to the institutional setting, uh, clearly, as you liberalize interest rates and let banks compete more freely, uh, the question of how you, uh, how you resolve institutions that may uh, overcompete and therefore get into trouble, how you protect depositors in that context and therefore deposit insurance resolution framework is critical. But also, again, and this comes up sometimes in statements by the, by the authorities now, you know, the question of how in a more liberal system you then establish appropriate budget constraints. And what's the new anchor in the system once you remove credit controls and once you remove the exchange rate and once you remove the interest rate, you have to have a new anchor that pins the system down, and which in our system tends to be ownership and the accountability for failure and bankruptcy system and exit mechanisms. And in a system that is still has widespread government guarantees, that is a critical issue to resolve before you go fully and let the system go. Uh, and fourth, uh, revamping the monetary framework, uh, an important issue for us from the fund. As more and more financial intermediation takes place outside of the banks, um, last year, as I said, the flow of bank lending outside the critical credit channels was 60%. Um, it will be important now more and more to use the interest rate as the primary instrument of monetary control rather than quantity controls. Um, and uh, that entails continuing to move away from these quantitative administrative mechanisms and rely increasingly on money market interest rates and that entails a whole uh, range of reforms to the monetary system and to the short term money markets that uh, they need to uh, put into place. So this sums up what needs to be done. Clearly a lot is on the minds of the authorities. This is an ongoing process. Still, um, the, the question of uh, you know, how you design a roadmap going forward, what, what's next is a, is a complex one, and, uh, and uh, you know, vested interest is one issue. 
The other issue is, of course, um, stability. Uh, financial liberalizations around the world have been littered with accidents, almost like the road to Mount Everest. Uh, there's lots of corpus, corpses left and right, and it's something that the authorities cannot afford uh, and don't want to uh, afford. Um, so therefore, um, in a way, clearly planned, careful reforms, but again now is probably the time with the new leadership to make a new push in, into those areas. Thank you very much. Thank, <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. That was a really good lay down. And um, we'll move right on to Bob and then um, go from there. You want to come up as well? Great. Well, I want to thank Matthew very much for the invitation. Uh, I've worked with Matthew for years, both in the government and outside the government. I also want to thank Tim Adams, uh, for whom I worked. I benefited enormously uh, when I worked with Tim, both on China and on Asia. I go to listen to him every chance I get, and I want to thank him for his kind references to things I know and also things I don't know that will uh, <laughs> come apparent. Uh, if you look at the podium, I'm sandwiched between the IMF and the U.S. Financial Services Forum. Um, I think that that's appropriate since the work of the Treasury straddles both worlds. Uh, I just got back from visiting Beijing with Secretary Liu. I'm now very focused on the strategic and economic dialogue. Uh, Sharon Yuan is my uh, uh, colleague, is the coordinator of the dialogue, but I'm heavily involved in it. Uh, I want to echo something that John Hamry said at the beginning, which is that the United States has a huge interest in strong, sustained growth of the Chinese economy. Uh, as, as we have made clear, as uh, President Xi uh, emphasized when we were in Beijing, the United States and China have enormous shared interests. We also have our own interests, things we want in the dialogue, things that they want in the dialogue. Um, um, but it's important to keep in mind the, the, the shared interest in the, that we have in the health of the global economy and the health of our own economies. Uh, our objectives, the U.S. government, the Treasury's objectives in the strategic and economic dialogue is to support U.S. growth, to support Chinese growth, and to support growth of the global economy. Uh, it's also to assure as much as possible that the United States benefits to the full extent from the economic relationship that we have with China, that it creates new employment and new opportunities for American firms and workers. I tend to divide what we do in the dialogue, what, what we do in Treasury, into two broad approaches. Uh, the first is the sort of standard trade market opening uh, negotiation type approach uh, to create additional markets, access opportunities, and a level playing field for U.S. firms and workers. Now, this strategic and economic dialogue covers a variety of issues. Uh, we're here to discuss the financial sector, which is also the responsibility of the Treasury. And so I'll talk about financial services, but I don't want to leave the impression that it's the only thing that matters. Uh, the United States has a highly competitive financial services sector. And a substantial part of our dialogue is, has been focused on opening up new opportunities for U.S. financial services providers and for foreign financial services providers generally. That's good for us. It's also good for China, bringing the kind of technology, market expertise, operational experience that can lead to the development of the Chinese financial services market. Uh, the work that we do here is specific, often highly technical, but also valuable to the firms and to the industries involved. I grouped it quickly into three broad categories, not entirely uh, distinct. Opening up new markets, so the ability of insurance firms to offer mandatory third-party auto liability insurance, um, or for U.S. firms to uh, participate in the credit-backed asset, uh, sorry, the credit backed securitization process pilot in China, or the ability to establish joint venture commodity and financial futures brokerages. Uh, my second broad area is the expansion of the range of activities available to foreign financial services providers, allowing security company joint ventures to enter brokerage, proprietary uh, trading and fund management is a good example, allowing banks to distribute mutual funds and to underwrite corporate bonds, or increasing the size of the qualified foreign uh, 
institutional intermediaries is another. The third that I'll mention is increasing the flexibility and the ownership available to foreign financial services providers. China is distinctive in that it has very restrictive limits on the equity participation of foreign financial services providers. Uh, increasing the ability of foreign firms to participate in an equity ownership basis, in particular the ability to establish controlled ventures within China, has been a priority of the United States since the forming of the Strategic Economic Dialogue, renamed as the Strategic and Economic Dialogue. Uh, last summer, we had the first break in the dam, this dam. Uh, the Chinese agreed to allow foreign securities joint ventures to increase their equity ownership stake to 49%, up from the 33% that they, China committed to in the WTO. Uh, it's not the end of this story, but it's an important step. That's one thrust of what we do. Uh, the other thrust is something that Tim talked about, Marcus talked about, and you'll detect a great deal of uniformity of approach and, and view in that. And that's supporting strong, sustained Chinese, US, and global growth in the future. Um, the way that I describe this, writing down my notes for this section, I think the, you can phrase the issue for China as the following. How can China sustain growth in the future with a declining labor force, rising costs, declining investment returns, and weaker global demand growth, certainly weaker than we've had in the past decade, or the decade before the crisis, particularly since China has depended so heavily on exports and on an increasing share of investment in GDP for growth. Marcus referred to a 10 percentage point increase in the investment share of GDP in the 10 years prior to the, I guess prior to now. Uh, since 2006, it's been about a seven percentage point increase in investment to GDP. Um, so how can China sustain growth, but also of particular interest to the United States and to the global economy, how can China sustain growth in a way that adds to global aggregate demand and supports global growth without having the large trade and current account imbalances that characterize the period just before the crisis, without having those imbalances reemerge? Financial reform and development is intimately tied up um, I'm sorry, um, the, the diagnosis or the discussion that we do, the fund does, Chinese authorities do, is focused on changing the Chinese growth model or growth strategy to have a greater dependence on household consumption for growth and a smaller reliance on exports and on investment to shift from heavy trade-oriented industry towards more domestically focused industries, particularly services, and to shift from a reliance or emphasis on state-owned enterprises to supporting smaller, more nimble private-owned enterprises in the future. Financial development and reform is intimately tied up with all of these, these goals. It will require, achieving them will require a liberalized, market-driven financial services industry. One, as Marcus mentioned, that depends much more on interest rate or price signals and much less on quantity controls on credit. One that's no longer skewed towards state-owned enterprises, but is able to effectively channel firms to small, new, profitable private enterprises. Um, liberalization of the financial system would also assist in many of the other goals in changing the, the growth model. Raising deposit interest rates would raise household income on the primary financial asset that they own. Uh, a wider range of financial services products would give households the means and the flexibility to insure against catastrophic risk and also to finance rather than save in advance for major expenditures like home purchase or education. Um, and finally, um, something that's 
become important in our discussions recently, changing the way the financial operations of the enterprise sector, in particular, in particular increasing the dividend payout of enterprises both privately owned and state owned, uh, would raise the incomes of households either directly or indirectly by financing government services and a, a stronger social safety net. Um, our discussions in the SED and the SANDED over the past few years have emphasized the market opening aspect of financial services. They've emphasized the broad macro characteristics of the Chinese economy, including exchange rate policy that I'll talk about in a minute. But in the past couple of SNEDs, we've opened up discussion with China on two key issues. One is broad financial sector reform, including interest rate liberalization. And the second is level playing field issues surrounding the state-owned enterprises, and in addition, the payment of dividends by state-owned enterprises to the uh, to the other sectors of the economy. In the last SNED, I'm a government official, so I tend to quote these things officially, uh, the Chinese agreed to increase the dividend payout ratio of state-owned enterprises, to increase the number of central and provincial state-owned enterprises that paid dividends, and also to increase the amount of dividend payments that went directly into the general account budget as opposed to being remitted to the, the SASIC, the state-owned holding companies. Um, China also agreed to steadily promote market-based reform of interest rates to enhance the role of interest rates in optimizing resource allocation and monetary policy transmission. And the Chinese government also committed to de developing a market environment of fair competition for enterprises of all kinds of ownership and to providing non-discriminatory treatment for enterprises of all ownerships in terms of credit provision, taxation incentives, and regulatory policies. Financial sector reform, liberalization, development is inextricably bound up with the goals that the Chinese government have for themselves. The, they are things that they need to do to sustain growth. Um, moving to a market-oriented exchange rate will also greatly assist in this process. Um, uh, both within financial services and more broadly within the ch Chinese economy. Uh, continued appreciation of the exchange rate will raise household incomes. It will help shift domestic resources away from tradable goods, heavy industry sectors, toward more domestically focused industries sectors like services. And the failure to adopt a more market-oriented exchange rate policy and to avoid the kind of management and extensive intervention to prevent appreciation of the currency would be a tremendous constraint to financial liberalization, to interest rate reform, and also to liberalization of the capital account, uh, the kind of reforms that China needs to, to carry forward. Uh, the next strategic and economic dialogue will take place sometime in the summer. I say sometime because I'm quite aware of the difficulties of uh, scheduling with four principals and the President of the United States. It'll be here in Washington. Uh, Secretary Liu will lead for the United States in the econ track, Secretary Kerry in the strategic track. Uh, the Chinese government has just formed a couple weeks ago and we're waiting for them to name their principles, our counterparts for, for our two secretaries. We look forward to seeing them, to hosting them in the summer. Uh, in the econ track, the issues I've described and many more but will be, uh, be uh, quite extensively discussed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. I'm rapidly running out of questions uh, for the for the post panel discussion because everything I'm, I was going to ask is being addressed. But uh, but I'll try. Uh, so let's move on to uh, to John. Thanks. I was just going to say that the the burden and the blessing of being the last speaker is that per everybody else has pretty much said what you were going to say, and um, and the audience is desperate for you to be brief and sit down. And so I will try to be I will try to obey that um, and take a slightly different approach. 
Um, first, thank you to CSIS, thank you to Matthew for the invitation to come. Uh, a special thank you to Bob. Um, the, the important work uh, of the SNED um, uh, that, that he just described and some of the progress that has been achieved in recent SNEDs and over the years since 2006, I think was the first one, Bob. Uh, Bob and Sharon Juan and their colleagues at Treasury, Lel Brainerd, th these are the people who do the really, really hard, arduous work that goes into each SNED. Um, and that has, uh, has yielded what we think is really meaningful progress over the years. So uh, to, to the benefit of both uh, China and the United States, and we certainly appreciate it. Um, I thought I would, I would uh, uh, Matthew mentioned at the beginning that uh, the forum chairs a group here in town called Engage China, and I thought I might explain uh, how that came to be and what our interest, what the Financial Services Forum's interest is in China and, and the role that we're trying to play. Uh, when Hank Paulson became the Treasury, the secret uh, 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 Secretary uh, of the Treasury, um, uh, he was, as you know at the time, uh, the Chief Executive of, of Goldman Sachs. Uh, he was also the Chairman of the Financial Services Forum at the time. Uh, the Forum is a, uh, a financial and economic policy group here in town uh, that is comprised of the Chief Executives of uh, uh, currently 19 of the largest financial institutions in the United States. Uh, it is not a trade group in the conventional sense. It doesn't tend to focus on, the, on what you might think of as the narrow parochial interest of the industry, but rather on, on big, broad issues of financial and economic policy that are important to the CEOs of these large financial institutions. They felt that, as a group, they have important things to share with policymakers based on the privileged vantage point uh, that they uh, their their viewpoint on the U.S. and global economies and what they see uh, in the, in the uh, day to day as the uh, as the CEOs of these institutions. So China has been uh, a major interest and a major concern of the forum for uh, for years, um, and took on a special interest when 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 Hank Paulson was our chairman, uh, given Hank's uh, uh, long and abiding uh, experience and interest in in China. So. When, when Hank went to Treasury, it was not surprising to us uh, that, he, that he brought that, uh, uh, that interest uh, and made China and made financial sector reform and modernization in China a real priority uh, of, his, of his time at Treasury. And it was not long after he was there, of course, that um, uh, uh, Treasury announced, uh, along with the Chinese, that President Bush and President Hu Jintao had established uh, what was then called the Strategic Economic Dialogue. Um, which was meant to uh, uh, provide a, a, a very senior level uh, a framework of dialogue, an overarching uh, kind of framework of dialogue to, to further enhance the uh, uh, communication and understanding on both sides and to manage a very multifaceted uh, uh, relationship uh, in, a, in a better and more productive and more effective way. Uh, Secretary Paulson, on, on behalf of the United States, and Madam Wu, Wu Yi, uh, on behalf of the Chinese uh, were the uh, two leads. Um, uh, we thought, uh, 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 given the development of the SED and how important it was and, and our interest at the forum in China and, and knowing and understanding how important um, a financial sector reform and modernization was, not only in China, but uh, it was our view, as it was uh, Secretary Paulson's view, that uh, a financial sector reform in China was not just important in terms of China being able to uh, realize and achieve its own uh, macroeconomic ambitions, uh, 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 specifically, or most importantly, more sustained long-term growth, uh, but also was really the key uh, to many of the, of the issues and some of the difficulties that had defined the bilateral relationship for so many years, and in particular, the currency issue and the trade imbalance issue. Uh, so uh, we, after thinking about it for a, a, a while, uh, uh, came up with the idea of creating Engage China, which is a coalition of the major, of the major trade groups here in town uh, uh, to provide uh, what you might call a private sector echo uh, to what uh, Secretary Paulson and Bob and their colleagues were trying to accomplish at Treasury vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese. Um, and uh, uh, we had two basic messages for uh, uh, two different audiences. Uh, one was uh, uh, that, that actually gave rise to the very clever name of the coalition Engage China. Our first constituency was, was, was Congress, uh, uh, policymakers on the Hill. And our point to them, and, uh, and has been our point to them for, uh, for seven years, 
is to, is to continuously remind them that constructive engagement in China is fundamentally uh, uh, the way to go. Uh, that, uh, 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 number one, it has worked. Uh, it seems sometimes that uh, progress w with China on the whole range of issues sometimes uh, can be uh, f frustratingly slow. Uh, from our standpoint, it can be, it can seem very incremental, but that in fact, if you look back over the years, particularly, you know, say going back to 1979, uh, if you look back at what has been accomplished uh, uh, by the two net nations, it's really quite remarkable. Um, especially, uh, you know, I think the, the first major milestone, of course, was China's accession to the WTO, but, but uh, uh, since then some really uh, uh, meaningful progress, some of which you uh, uh, heard about today from um, Tim and from Bob. Um, uh, so we have, uh, we spend a lot of time on the Hill reminding policymakers of that and encouraging them to avoid some of the more punitive uh, measures that tend to come up from time to time. And of course, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the currency legislation and try to focus on more positive aspects of the relationship and bringing to bear some of the pressure uh, that sometimes is brought, uh, we think, in a little too heated a way on things like currency and really focus it on on other areas that we think are more important, specifically market ask, a access, expanded market access uh, for U.S. participation in China. Uh, our second um, uh, uh, targeted audience is the Chinese themselves. Uh, and, and this is the sense, uh, uh, I think, that Engage China tries to play something of a private sector, a private sector echo to um, w uh, what's trying to be done uh, at the official level. Uh, and our principal, uh, our principal message is, you, you've heard a lot today about uh, how China uh, uh, has committed to uh, uh, pulling off, achieving this, this, this quite uh, ambitious goal, very difficult but very essential goal of a shift from uh, their traditional uh, e economic model of, um, uh, of manufacturing for export and fixed investment to a much more consumption-based, internally dr driven economic model. Um, they are convinced, I think most folks who, who are China watchers are convinced, this needs to be done, as Tim talked about earlier. Uh, the old mo model has uh, sort of reached uh, a stage of diminishing returns <clears throat> and is actually creating problems. So uh, uh, we are very, very supportive of, uh, of their goal that they've articulated in at least the last couple of five-year plans of, of, of wanting to pull off this shift uh, to become a much more consumer-based and internally dr driven uh, a model of demand. Our, in that context, our message to them is doing that is, is, is so challenging, it, it, it is virtually impossible to conceive of how that can be done without a financial sector that can serve that transition. Um, uh, you've heard about a lot of the problems today in, in, in the financial sector about how bank-based it is, about how the capital markets are underdeveloped, you know, small and underdeveloped, even by emerging market standards. A tremendous amount of progress has been made in recent, in, uh, in recent years, and yet there still are, are profound problems. On the consumer side, most Chinese do not have access to the kinds of products and services that we all take for granted in terms of personal consumption products, mortgage products, even things like credit cards, uh, uh, retirement security products, products that allow us to save and invest effectively. Uh, and, and then, of course, insurance products to mitigate the risks of life, everything from property and casualty to life insurance. Most Chinese don't have ready access to those products, uh, and, and because that they don't, uh, uh, many of them engage in what's called precautionary savings. Uh, a, a Chinese household save 30, 40, sometimes even 50 percent of their incomes. Uh, this uh, uh, amounts to a structural obstacle to the shift to a more consumption-based uh, a Chinese economy. So our message to the Chinese is, is, is financial sector reform and modernization is absolutely key to your macroeconomic goal of shifting from uh, a manufacturing for export model to a more consumption based uh, uh, model. And, and in order to achieve that kind of, of reform and modernization of the financial sector, a major priority from our, our standpoint, as, as Bob alluded to earlier, is is greater foreign participation in the Chinese marketplace. You heard Tim earlier talk about the penetration rates in terms of banking and insurance. Uh, uh, foreign banks account for less than 2% of the Chinese uh, banking sector. I think, I think the number he mentioned in terms of insurance was uh, less than one and a half. 
uh, Bob uh, mentioned some of the restrictions in terms of, in terms of ownership um, uh, of, of foreign investment in, in banks, securities firms, asset management firms, insurance. Um, uh, uh, Tim had mentioned earlier the value uh, uh, of some of the value that, ex that uh, expanded or greater foreign participation in Chinese in, in, uh, the Chinese financial sector w w would bring best practices and expertise in terms of products and services, uh, in terms of credit analysis, internal controls, corporate governance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We feel that uh, China is in need of a world-class financial system. It doesn't have a world-class financial system, and the, and the fastest way to get it is to, in effect, import it. Um, so our, uh, 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 our uh, that's our principal uh, uh, message to the Chinese. Our, our top line priorities in that context are, as you might imagine, uh, to lift, uh, raise, or, or, uh, uh, or possibly even lift uh, the ownership restrictions on, on, on banking and securities, asset management and insurance, um, uh, national treatment uh, with regard to licensing and corporate form. Uh, uh, in China, uh, national treatment in terms of products and services uh, that are permitted, national treatment uh, with regard to regulation and supervision, um, a regulatory uh, a and procedural transparency, um, and then further expansion in the um, uh, qualified foreign investment program. Uh, 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 we think all of these, all of this is, is very much um, in China's interest, uh, given their, their, their long-range uh, uh, macroeconomic objectives. It's certainly in the interest of the United States, as Bob and others have mentioned. Uh, 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 the futures and the fortunes of the U.S. and, and, and Chinese economy are, are, are very much I I intertwined, and we think that this is a win-win from both sides. Um, I'll stop there. Th thank you very much. Thank you. As I said, uh, really um, comprehensive uh, coverage of, of, of a lot of the issues um, that I was again going to ask about. Um, uh, I will ask a question, but um, let me just say as a comment that um, because all the speakers I think addressed really the underlying rationale for uh, financial reform in China, which I think broadly cluster around three sets of, is sets of issues, one of which is to uh, promote uh, strong, sustainable, balanced growth in China. Uh, another is to avoid risks, uh, to manage risks, to mitigate risks. And the third is to provide uh, 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 more opportunities for foreign institutions in China, which could provide uh, more competition, a more efficient system. Um, and I think um, those are all important and they're all intertwined. Um, I do think that the growth uh, imperative is the one that, that matters most to all of us. Uh, and that's why we call this, or we put this under our uh, Simon Chair Growth Forum, because really uh, the success or otherwise in the Chinese government's ability to manage this transition and, and uh, undertake these reforms is critical to Chinese uh, growth, as, as everyone has said, and, uh, and that matters a lot to all of us, um, because we need uh, China to grow and we need, uh, we need that source of demand uh, um, uh, in the world. Um, and uh, so that's really sort of a comment to reinforce what everybody has said in one form or another. Um, I guess the question is, is to start to kick it off is with, with Mark, to Marcus about, um, about the sequencing of reforms. Um, to what extent does it matter uh, what order they do this in? And to what extent are there risks in uh, doing it in the wrong order or doing some particular thing uh, and not some other particular thing that's going to cause the whole house of cards to fall down. Is there anything in particular that you'd be worried about if they got it out of order? Yeah, thank you. Uh, clearly, sequencing matters. Um, there, there are a few ground rules, I think, that are quite well known. For example, don't open your capital account too much before you're sure that you have a domestic system. Make sure that before you fully liberalize interest rates, you, you have the, the supervision and the institutions in place. Um, so uh, now the question always is, does that mean we have to have a very detailed, clear roadmap spe spelled out that, does, that maps everything down? Um, just recently we had a conference in China on capital account liberalization two weeks ago, and the question from the Chinese was clear. So do you advise us to have a very detailed, clear roadmap plan that is laid out? So our generally we had experts from 15 other emerging markets who had gone through capital account liberalization there. And their experience basically has been 
in a way paraphrasing what um, a very senior uh, U.S. official once said about uh, war planning, which means um, plans are useless, but planning is essential. So clearly, I think they are now in the process of, of writing down for themselves a very clear, detailed roadmap for the first one, two years of what to be done. But they are never going to announce that, nor should they, because you know things change and you don't want to announce a plan. So uh, again, s sequencing is important. Uh, you know, we can talk about details. There's a five or six rules that you want to make sure you you, you observe. But then again things continuously change on the ground. There are also idiosyncrasies of China where, for example, normally you would think of liberalizing the capital account sort of in, 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 in terms of categories where you, where you go first with uh, foreign direct investment and then you go with uh, maybe long-term portfolio investment and at the very end you do short-term portfolio. That's fine and good for China. The way they are going to do it is, is however, they have a tradition of for example, authorizing a few institutions where they have confidence, where they can monitor, give them a certain quota, and then raise these, raise these quotas. For example, you will not allow domestic depositors, give them a blanket. Whoever has a, a deposit over three months can move these deposits o o offshore. I think rather than doing it th this way, they will uh, authorize uh, a number of institutions who can channel those savings within quotas so that they, they can keep and I think that's a good approach that has served them well in, in, in other areas. So it's as much a question of sequencing as it is about carefully sort of opening up various valves, let them move, and as things, as things evolve, monitor very closely and open up more. Okay, thanks. <laughs> no, I mean, I think to. actually not. Yeah, uh, I'm Stephen Canna, uh, retired from Treasury and the U.S. Council for International Business. And I think my question is for Bob Dona. Uh, you just came back from China, you said, with the Secretary, and you talked a lot about what we're pushing China on in the SNED. Could you share with us other, what the Chinese want from us other than getting rid of CFIUS? I mean, we, we have some financial issues, too, that they have a stake in. So you know, it takes two to tango. What, can you tell us something. <laughs> um, I mean, they, the Chinese government is interested in the health of the U.S. economy, uh, the continued growth, uh, having the United States navigate our way through our, our fiscal challenges. Uh, they're also um, interested in increased access both continued and increased access to the U.S. market for trade, for investment. Uh, they're interested in U.S. investment policy, negotiating a bilateral investment treaty with the United States. They're interested in U.S. export control regime, uh, in achieving market economy status for trade remedy matters, um, in the ability, or, sorry, in increased opportunities to invest in the United States, particularly in infrastructure projects. Uh, so these are a variety of things we discuss with the Chinese. And, and does that, I mean, did, are there sort of trade-offs here? I mean, are there, does that give you leverage when you talk to them about these, the financial services issues? Or why, why I guess the more fundamental question is, why do they listen to us? Why, I mean, I'm interested that they're willing to engage on, they're interested, they're willing to engage even on interest rate deregulation, I think you said. Um, uh, understand why they would sort of feel they had to engage on the question of foreign uh, firms' access or U.S. firms' access, but, but why would they talk to us about some of these sort of fundamental issues of, of reform? I, I think two reasons. I mean, why, why do they do the strategic economic dialogue at all? <coughs> And the answer is that um, the U.S. and China are the two largest economies in the world. Uh, I think the largest bilateral na national trade relationship, China exports more to the European Union, but exports more to the United States, trades more with the United States than any single country. 
Um, we have had a trade relationship that has been unbalanced, a uh, substantial bilateral deficit. Uh, there have been issues in the trade relationship. Uh, the exchange rate is a, a particularly uh, hot issue over the last few years. So that the process of discussion, uh, making progress on individual issues, creating new market access opportunities is a way of addressing the concerns and the critics of the trade relationship uh, that allows it to continue to go forward and benefit both sides. Um, I, I would like to think that our Chinese colleagues are interested in what we have to say about, uh, about the China's challenges that China faces. I'm thinking many times they are, and many times they've probably heard it all before, but uh, um, <clears throat> And actually, one, one last thing, one thing that I didn't mention in my remarks. Um, we've talked a lot about financial sector risks and managing financial sector risks. Um, one thing that the crisis has done and the, the development of the G20 <coughs> as an organization, the Financial Stability Board as an organization, it has brought Chinese officials, Chinese regulators into international discussions of regulatory practice and financial sector risk. Uh, in a way that I think has benefited. China certainly has benefited the, the global economy. Uh, the fact that China agreed to have a financial sector stability assessment, agreed to publish this, the assessment. Uh, this is a, a financial sector diagnostic undertaken by the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, the fact that they agreed to publish the assessment and the detailed assessment reports, I think is a, is a real step forward in understanding the Chinese financial system, both on their part and our part, and on um, sort of addressing concerns about financial sector risk. Yeah. And I would, uh, you know, say that my impression is that that uh, is, is one of the values of the G20 conversations that you have with China as well, because you're doing a lot of uh, discussion of, of some of the underlying uh, elements of a uh, a, a sound, you know, financial regulatory regime, and not to mention talking about strong, sustainable, balanced growth, and I think that's got to be of benefit, and they probably recognize that. But that's that's good. Okay, so who else over here? The gentleman in the second row there. Uh, thank you, Akira Chiba of the Japanese Embassy, and my question goes to Mr. Rodlauer, who uh, mentioned that the tasks China faces are similar to other transitional uh, economies, if I heard him right. So my question is, uh, is there any similar example in the past? And if so, what lessons can be drawn from such previous experience? I mentioned it mainly in the context of the challenge of um, ref liberalizing a system while the remnants of a certain governance model, which is state-owned enterprises with widespread state-owned uh, uh, financial institutions and large uh, public guarantees in the system. That has been a challenge that has vexed many, many uh, other transition economies, uh, and particularly the in early stages of uh, Big Bang liberalization, except perhaps the one in Poland, but many others were infected by the persistence of state guarantees, which allowed these units and entrepreneurs and, uh, and entities to, to go out and, and, and lend and borrow without facing budget constraints and without facing the consequences. And that has created huge problems, I think. So, you know, the way this has been solved is different. In, 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 uh, in Poland, for example, the combination of, uh, of bankruptcy regimes that were biting and very rigorous control by the financial of, of the nine large state-owned banks by uh, state commissars who basically made sure that these banks didn't go wild in competing for funds in the newly liberalized environment. So uh, it was mainly in that context that I mentioned it. So, uh, Thank you. Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. My question is for Mr. Robert. And, uh, I still remember that uh, Secretary Geithner uh, linked the uh, U.S. implementation of its commitments to giving Chinese companies uh, fair treatment and 
uh, releasing the high tech control to the China's achievements uh, of addressing U.S. concerns. So what could we expect from the coming as an ED? What achievement, what delivery could the both sides could reach? And secondly, you just came back from China and had a contact with Chinese new leaders. What's your imp impression about Chinese new leaders? How would you evaluate their incentive to continue the economic reform, particularly in financial sector? Thank you. Let me do the second one first. I mean, I, I had a very brief introduction to China's new leaders when I went to, to China with the secretary. Um, my impressions of them, I think our impressions of them, are they very impressive, very determined, um, very clear in their desire to pursue economic reform, um, to, to continue China's growth, very clear on their desire to work with the United States and, and the global community. Um, uh, it's very early in their administration, and this was a short visit. There was very little discussion about specific measures or, or timing, as, as one would expect. Uh, but, um, you know, I think we, we came away with a very clear and favorable impression of the, the leaders we, leaders the Secretary met. Um, on the SNED and what we, we hope to accomplish, um, it's a little early for me to say, um, since we were just, it's, it's not that we're just beginning because we have worked with Ministry of Finance officials in anticipation of new leaders on our side and on China's side. But uh, now the hard work begins on both organizing the discussion and on the individual items in the discussion. Um, we will continue our efforts to uh, assure that both sides have implemented the commitments that they've made in the past in the SNED. And we'll also try to reach new new commitments, new new outcomes in in that discussion. Um, the topics that we will pursue, not surprisingly, will be topics that we've we've pursued in the past, both on the U.S. side and on the Chinese side. Although we you know we always look for and, and hope for new things that are that are possible and doable in the context of the, the SNED. Okay. I'm Keita Miyaki, uh, a student from Johns Hopkins High School. I'd like to listen to your ideas. Uh, I'd like to know your ideas on the implication of China, Chinese financial reform on the debt service of the United States and the status of the USD in the future. The question was the impact of Chinese financial reform on the debt service of the United States and whether China is going to continue buying our treasuries. Is that what you are asking? <laughs> I'm sure Bob would love to answer that question. No, uh, seriously, but maybe, maybe Marcus would be a little more uh, neutral. Is there an impact? Is there a concern? You can do it, Bob. Well, all right. I mean, let, let me talk about about U.S. Treasuries and and uh, and demand for Treasuries. Um, our concern is and always has been assuring the the fundamentals that of the U.S. economy and financial system that would make U.S. Treasuries a safe and attractive investment opportunity for foreign buyers, but also for American buyers. And in fact, Americans own the majority of U.S. Treasury securities. Um, we, in our policy recommendations, have recommended changes in Chinese economic policy, changes in global economic policy that would actually reduce 
current account deficit, or current account imbalances globally. Uh, we have argued for a greater market determination of exchange rate and reduced intervention, reduced foreign exchange reserve accumulation broadly. Um, but that's within the context of a general equilibrium system in which we in the United States increase our national saving, consolidate our fiscal deficit, which is already taking place to a large degree, and um, you know, where a, broader, a broad range of investors buy our securities, um, less ideally through foreign exchange intervention than through um, investment more broadly. Uh, no, Bob basically uh, mentioned what I was going to say. Rebalancing is not just for China to save less, but for others to save more, obviously. And if you were to just do a scenario, in fact, we've done that, what's the impact of Chinese uh, uh, rebalancing on the, on the world? It's actually negative. If you think that savings decline, interest rates go up, global growth is lower. But that's not the idea of rebalancing. The idea is rebalancing that others save more. And obviously, as Bob said, there's an important task for advanced economies, not just in the U.S., but in Japan and, uh, and Europe. Sure, sure John. Um, I'll take a stab at the question in a different sort of way. The, um, um, the vast holdings on the part of the Chinese of, of, of U.S. Treasuries, um, in, a, in a very real sense, is a manifestation of the, of the trade imbalance. Um, uh, and so if you, uh, if you think that that's a problem, uh, then clearly part of the solution is a rebalancing uh, of the trade relationship. Um, clearly, the United States needs to save more, but I think it's also uh, reasonable to argue, and I think even the Chinese would agree with this, this is the reason why they're trying to uh, achieve this shift in their economy that, that we've been talking about, is for China to consume more. <clears throat> and let me just give you a back of the, of the napkin, you know, sort of analysis of what, the, of, the, uh, of the potential of this shift in strategy in, in the context of the, of the trade relationship. Last year, in 2012, the United States exported to China about $110 billion worth of stuff. We exported to uh, Japan about $70 billion. But China, of course, is 10 times the size of Japan. Um, if China were to eventually consume American-made products and services at the same rate that the Japanese currently do, that implies that the United States would export on, on the order of about $700 billion worth to China, which would, all else being equal, turn a, a pr approximately $350 billion trade deficit into a $350 billion trade surplus. Um, and if you, if, you, if you think that that's a fanciful goal, which on first blush it seems quite fanciful, if you look back at the extent to which U.S. exports have, uh, to China have grown over the last 10 years, they've grown at about an average annual rate of 18 percent. Some, some years have been better than others. You know, some years are 30 percent, some are 6 percent, but uh, on average over the last 10 years, it's about an 18 percent uh, uh, growth rate in terms of U.S. exports to China. If you apply that rate of growth, that average annual rate of growth uh, to future years, off of the base that we exported 110 billion to China last year, you get to 700 billion in 11 years. So th this is not something, in our view, that that is uh, is impossible at all. And and this just goes to show you uh, how what the Chinese have identified they need to do in terms of uh, putting themselves on a on a long term and more sustainable path to growth is also very, very good for the United States. Uh, and by the way, it, if you apply the Commerce Department's metric of, you know, for every billion dollars in additional U.S. exports uh, creates about 5,000 new American jobs, expanding U.S. exports to China from 110 billion to 700 billion over the next 10 years translates into 3 million new American jobs. So I think that's a perfect example of how, you know, working together, w what is good for China can be very good for the United States. 
Okay, thanks. So I'm going to take three questions. Vikram, the gentleman there, and uh, was it Joe or Bill, or both of you wanted to ask? Bill? Joe? You're pointing to each other. You're going to ask half the question each? No. Vikram, right here in the front. I'm sorry. Well, thank you very much uh, for your presentations uh, and for holding this session, Matt. Um, we're almost coming to the end of the session, uh, and I haven't heard from any of the speakers so far any discussion of the link between financial sector reforms and fiscal policy. Now, financial s the financial sector's objective is to intermediate between savers and investors. The fiscal system's objective is to raise resources to provide public goods and services and partly to provide some redistribution. Now in China, to some extent, those two objectives are conflated in the financial sector. When you introduce interest rate liberalization, as virtually all of you have, have, have recommended, you are taking away some of the fiscal uh, burdens of the financial sector, away from the financial sector. Now, presumably, those fiscal burdens have to be transferred to the fiscal system. Is the fiscal system capable of assuming those burdens? How long will it take for the fiscal system to take on those additional responsibilities? Because isn't the fiscal system itself facing challenges? And what does that mean for the pace of reforms in the financial sector? Thank you. I should just, before you say anything, I just say Vikram Nehru was also, I'm allowed to say this publicly now, right? Now that it's been published in, in Mandarin, uh, was the author, uh, when he was at the World Bank, of the uh, China 2030 report, and I commend it to you now that it's available in public. Thanks. Uh, Don Clark, GW Law School. Um, this is a question for um, uh, Dr. Don Donor about uh, uh, dividends. and. Um, it's a simple question, but I have to preface it a little bit because we need to distinguish two types of dividends depending on why we care about dividends. Um, if it's about rebalancing, uh, then we need to be asking about listed company dividends, you know, which are going to go to households. But the part of listed company dividends that doesn't go to households does not go uh, to SASAC or the Ministry of Finance. It goes to uh, you know, uh, intermediate level uh, SOEs or these holding companies that are in turn owned by uh, a SASAC and, and the Ministry of Finance. So um, if we're concerned about uh, rebalancing and, and funds going to households and getting out of the state and corporate sector, then we should be asking about the level of listed company dividends. If China is say, making promises and saying things about what they're going to do about dividends going up to SASAC or MOF, that has nothing to do with this issue of rebalancing. That's just a question of uh, you know, redistribution of money within um, the state sector. So my question about dividends is about the first kind, that is listed company dividends that's going to households. And you know, everybody in China says they're too low. You know, that's sort of the common mantra. And I'm not, I, I don't know for a fact whether that's right or wrong, but my question is, how do we determine what kind of level is too low or too high? What's our kind of methodology for saying this is what uh, listed companies should be distributing to shareholders? And has anybody done a study actually to find out how much are listed companies distributing to shareholders? Where are we in China with relation to that kind of ideal level? Now, Joe, do you want to ask or Bill? I saw Bill first, but, but happy to take both of them if they're different. Well, I have to say that I am not, is that on? I'm not a, uh, an e economist or a financial expert uh, by any means, but listening to the conversation here, you have a lot of prescriptions for China. Uh, and uh, you noted that uh, China is not, it should be more of a consumer-based economy, I think. And you also uh, noticed that they should have uh, financial, various kinds of financial reform. In view of the fact that, that we are a consumer-based economy, and uh, uh, incomes are going down. Uh, and the fact that we had enormous financial collapse five years ago, what kind of a credibility do we have in lecturing to China? Okay, I think um, Vikram 
you raise a very, very good point, the quasi-fiscal uh, role of the current financial sector. In fact, uh, Albert Kaidel, as you know, makes that point very well, that what's wrong, or he uh, poses this question rhetorically, what's wrong with the system that collects vast amount of resources through the financial sector, taxing depositors, mm -hmm. taking away their wealth, and moving that into investment, and therefore growing very fast? Um, and w w once you stop that, what do you do? How do you get those resources? And I think first it's not a zero-sum game, but I want to say that second. There is, of course, a big issue of uh, that the current tax and the revenue system in, in, in China is broken. They know that very well. The last reform was, I don't know, 94, 94 which is um, almost uh, 20 years ago. Uh, for example, the VAT works very well for them, but it also goes to the center. Local governments have no resources for the vast expenditures they have to implement. Um, you know, so there's an issue of, of, of a redistributing the tax resources they have and finding new ones. In local government, local government taxation, property taxes, etc. So there is scope to raise more revenues to the tax system. But as I said, it's not a zero-sum game because our view is that capital is too cheap and too many resources are being moved into capital, and. The, move, the resources that are being moved in are allocated in an inefficient way. So there is both scope to reduce the amount of resources and to raise f and to invest more efficiently. For example, if you open up the service sectors and allow millions of small enterprises to start little shops in the service sectors and or allow new initiatives in many of these uh, c current, you will raise funds again through the financial sector on a competitive level for investments that are competitive enough to earn the returns. So again, it's not that you need to replace all this with new tax system. Part of it is true, but it, it's not a zero-sum game. Okay. Okay. Um, on, on dividends, a very good question and a very good point. I, um, when I think about dividends and their role in the economy, their role in imbalancing, I tend to take a, a macroeconomic sectoral approach, uh, distinguishing households, the government sector, and enterprises. Um, the problem with, with, or the reason that this is an issue for Chinese enterprises is that dividend payments have been generally very low by international comparisons, particularly for state-owned enterprises. Uh, many of the dividends that are paid by state-owned enterprises, you point out particularly the non-listed enterprises, are transferred from one pocket of the enterprise sector to another pocket of the enterprise sector and used to fund enterprise investment generally, although not necessarily by the dividend-paying enterprise. Um, listed companies paying dividends to uh, private owners can directly feed into the incomes of the household sector and directly into consumption. Um, dividends paid to the state as owner can feed directly into household incomes by increasing the resources of the state, allowing opportunities for reducing fees, state fees, uh, reducing taxation, strength increasing ta transfer payments, or strengthening social welfare system. So that's, that's the way in which we've thought about the enterprise, state-owned enterprise dividend payment. Uh, not that it's valuable to put it into the general budget per se, but that if you're interested in rebalancing once it's in the general budget, it can be used for other, for the other purposes. Um, on on lecturing China and and consumption based, um, what what credibility do we have? Um, the United States had a financial crisis but it did not have a financial crisis because it was a consumption-based economy. Um, you know, the consumption in the United States is, is high because household incomes are high and because household wealth accumulation has been high. In fact, if you look at the period leading up to the crisis, uh, the financial wealth of American households increased relative disposable income all out of bounds of historical experience. Much of that disappeared during the crisis, which is why U.S. household saving rates uh, rose so sharply and, and a good part of the reason why we went into a, uh, to a recession. Um, the reason that discussion of raising 
household consumption in China has credibility. And we're not the only ones to make the argument. I mean, it's, it's been a clear goal of the five-year plans, both the current one and the past two, is that both one, I think, of, of sustainability of growth. And also, if, if you're an economist broadly, it's a question of what are you growing for? Um, China has seen a gradual but very substantial rise in the share of, of national income, of GDP, that's devoted to and to investment, to in increasing uh, productive resources. Um, there are clear indications that the returns to that investment are falling and, and may in fact be, be uh, negative in, in some cases. Um, and it would be very hard to sustain an investment rate in an economy where growth falls because the labor force uh, begins to fall, certainly increases at a slower rate. Um, if you look at, at at why household consumption is is low in China, in fact, it's it's extraordinarily low. It's by measurement about 35 percent of GDP, which is maybe half what it is in the United States and a little bit more than what, half what it is in India uh, or Germany or any country. Um, it's in part due to the fact that Chinese households are high savers. Um, there are reasons that they save because they are few financial services products. But it is in large part because household income has gradually declined as a share of national income as income has shifted primarily to the, the enterprise sector. Um, I mean, it's, it's a value judgment, but an economist from any country looking at what has happened in China would say there's something strangely out of whack here. And it's not surprising, it's really not surprising to me as an economist that official Chinese discussion and planning has focused on shifting the balance back towards greater consumption in, in national income. Uh, can I say something very qu quickly? I, I, I interpreted your question to mean less a, dis a discussion about the wisdom of China shifting to a consumption-based economy, but how can, how can we lecture them specifically on financial sector reform uh, when we just went through this uh, horrific financial crisis? Isn't this a little ironic, to say the least? Um, I think it's a very fair point. Um, uh, and in fact, we, uh, in, in our annual trips to China, um, I, can, I can tell you that there was a discernible drop-off in the interest of what we had to say in 2009-ish um, uh, and 10 uh, relative to what, you know, the, re you know, the receptivity that we experienced in 2006, say. Um, and and uh, in fact, we had a, a, very, a very revealing as Bob knows, the, uh, the Chinese can be uh, uh, a breathtakingly, uh, uh, a breathtakingly uh, uh, direct at times, and um, we had a, had a very revealing meeting with the, uh, uh, the number two gentleman uh, at the Shanghai Stock Exchange, uh, who said to us, uh, you know, your financial crisis has been very upsetting for us, uh, b because uh, uh, it's very upsetting when you realize that, that uh, uh, the master is a fool. Um, and, um, and, and, and he was very straightforward and said, you know, we, we have held, you know, these institutions like Lehman Brothers and Merrill Lynch and et cetera, et cetera, in very high regard. We, we, we send some of our best students and government uh, officials over to work in these institutions and learn and learn, uh, you know, uh, uh, to try to discern and absorb some of the expertise. And then, and then these institutions fail and go away. Uh, and, and it's been very upsetting for us because we now have to ask ourselves, what are we trying to achieve? You know, if this financial system that we admired for so long has, is as vulnerable as it is, where, where does that leave us in terms of what our future is? Uh, so I, I, think that, I think that these are all very, very fair points and very un un understandable. Uh, our, our response was, um, you know, look, we, we've, we have learned some very important uh, lessons ourselves uh, from the financial uh, crisis, obviously. Um, and, uh, and we made some very fundamental errors. Um, I, I, I think it is fair to say our experiences, and I wonder if it's Bob's, that, um, that uh, they watched the, the reform process uh, that went on here uh, very, very carefully in terms of how we dealt with the crisis, how we responded to it. 
uh, and it's, it's our understanding and, uh, by way of the conversations that we've had that they were impressed uh, with how quickly uh, uh, the country dealt with the problem and responded to the problem uh, and were impressed uh, with the substance of the reforms. Um, and there is a, I can tell you that, that in recent trips there has been a renewed interest uh, in, in our council in our, our input in terms of their financial reform. So fair point, um, uh, but I, you know, it's an ongoing and dynamic dialogue. Okay, um, on that note, I was going to now, I did think of a actually interesting line of questioning, but I'm not going to ask it because, because we're at this time, but, uh, but we, will, we will do this again. But let me, before we thank the panelists, let me thank you uh, for your patience and staying for a you know, relatively long event on a relatively complex set of issues that isn't for everyone, but is, is very important, and I appreciate your staying, and, and thanks to our online viewers, including at least one hardy person in Beijing who I know has been watching but may have fallen asleep by now. <laughs> um, uh, but thank you all, and please thank the, uh, the panelists for their terrific uh, presentations. <laughs>